talk is uh, on single subject designs in clinical research. I'm Michael Rapoff, PhD, Ralph L. Smith Professor of Pediatrics and Vice Chair for Research here in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Kansas Medical Center. This um, lecture is meant to be a basic introduction into single subject design methodology. And first we'll start with a quote by Jung. Science works with concepts of averages, which are far too general to do justice to the subjective variety of an individual life. And so single subject designs are all about the variety of an individual's life and not averages, not group averages. So my objectives of this talk are one, to define single subject designs, then describe when traditional between group designs are needed, describe advantages of single subject designs, provide examples of different types of designs, and then finally to contrast visual inspection and statistical tests uh, associated with, uh, with the results of single subject design studies. So definition and synonyms, the definition of single subject design is a methodology for studying change in individuals or a single person. Synonyms that you'll see in the literature are N of one, or single case, or intra-subject replication, or within subject, or intensive design. And the reference here on the bottom by Barlow, Nock, and Herson is considered to be the definitive text on single case experimental designs, and it's in its uh, third edition. So when are between group designs needed? Randomized control trials are still considered the gold standard in establishing the efficacy of treatments. Uh, it's also helpful when attempting to determine the generalizability of results across groups of people. For example, the percent of people who are treated and improved versus a control group. And they're useful when comparing two or more potentially effective treatments. This can be done with single subject designs, but it's not as easily done. So the advantages of single subject designs are they are flexible in their choice of independent and dependent variables, and even changing these over the course of the study. They're quite appropriate for small samples, uh, making them very appropriate for studying rare conditions. They're appropriate when there are ethical objections to withholding treatment. They are better at exposing individual variability. Uh, the results are more easily understood by clinicians, and they also allow clinicians to do clinical research. They're recognized as helping to establish empirically validated treatments and evidence-based medical practices. So the design options we'll speak of here or one, the withdrawal or reversal design, next the multiple baseline, three variants of that across behaviors, subjects, or settings, the alter alternating treatment design, and the changing criterion design. So first, the withdrawal or reversal design is establishing cause while doing good. So it's the classic uh, form is an ABA, where A equals the baseline condition and B equals treatment. So there's a baseline, B, a treatment is introduced, and A, the treatment is withdrawn. The logic of this design, it, it controls the effects of treatment and subsequent removal. It confirms the effects of the independent variables. There are variants on the design, the ABAB, which has the advantage of ending on a treatment phase and providing two different treatment evaluations relative to baseline. And ABCB, where C is another treatment or a placebo condition. And then in drug trials, an APBPB, where A is no drug, uh, B is the drug, and P is a placebo condition. So this is the example of a uh, withdrawal design using um, one subject uh, from Rapoff et al. 1988 study. We were looking at adherence to medications in a young man who had arthritis. Uh, we started out, the first condition was baseline, and we used, in this case, uh, pill counts as the measure of adherence, which is on the origin of the abscissa, you can see, is weeks. So during the first week, you can see he was about 50% adherent, which is what you kind of expect with a chronic illness. And then something unexpected happened. The physician changed his regimen from um, three times a day to twice a day. 
Uh, that's simplifying the regimen. So this is the flexibility of single subject designs. We made this a condition. And as you can see, there was some increase in adherence just by simplifying the regimen, which you might assume. But then we introduced what we originally planned as the only intervention, which was the token system intervention, where he earned points for um, taking his medications, which he got to trade in for uh, special privileges. As you can see, his adherence jumped up to 100% during the first token system phase. And then the red box shows the withdrawal of the token system, and that's where the control element comes in. Because once the token system was withdrawn, then there was a drop in adherence. Uh, when it was reinstated in the next token system phase, his adherence increased again. And then during the maintenance phase, um, where he had the main adher adherence above 80%, but couldn't drop below 80% for more than two weeks in a row, or we would have reinstated the token system. Uh, that never happened, and his adherence remained uh, relatively high. And then a nine-month follow-up, he had very, uh, very good adherence to his medications. Uh, multiple baseline designs can be across behaviors, subjects, or settings. The logic of this design is the effects are shown when change occurs after the introduction of treatment while concurrent untreated behaviors or persons or settings remain relatively constant. It's useful when treatments cannot or should not be withdrawn or for drugs with very long half-lives. It's weaker than the withdrawal design because control is not shown for each target behavior, person, or setting. So this is an example of a multiple baseline across behaviors from the study that we did with a um, young lady who had arthritis. She was required to take her medicines without reminders. That was her mom's idea. Uh, to wear splints on her wrist at night to prevent contractures and to do a prone lying exercise also to prevent contractures in her hips. Um, as you can see, we have baseline in all three conditions and then we first introduced a token reinforcement program only for medications. As you can see, that increased uh, substantially while uh, we did not intervene with the splint wearing or the prone line. We then next introduced the token system for splint wearing and then that also increased. Um, and then the last behavior to, uh, that we introduced treatment for was for prone lying. As you can see, that also increased. And these were maintained at follow-up pretty well. So in this case, we're demonstrating the effects of a, an intervention across three different uh, separate behaviors. This is a multiple baseline across subjects. There were three patients with arthritis. We were looking at their adherence to medications. Um, the first patient, we um, introduced treatment, um, and they were a combination of educational and behavioral strategies. Not much of an increase for that patient. Patients two, patient two then had the intervention introduced after a period of time, and that that uh, for that patient adherence did increase and then it also increased for the third patient and stabilized more during the intervention phase. And as you can see, four months follow-up, um, some drops in adherence, but um, the situation was much better for patient two and three. So we concluded in this study that the intervention was not effective for patient one who happened to be a teenager uh, who had some other difficulties um, the two other children were younger uh, and did much better. But this is a, uh, a good illustration of a multiple baseline design across subjects. Alternating, alternating treatment design, also known as multiple schedule, multi-element baseline, randomization, or simultaneous treatment design, uh, its logic is that it addresses the effectiveness of two or more treatments by rapidly alternating them, either hourly or daily or by clinic sessions. Sequential confounding or order effects can be minimized by randomizing the order of treatments, having uh, washout periods between treatments, and applying treatments for uh, short periods of time. So this is a hypothetical uh, study of the percent time on task in a young person with ADHD. The alternating conditions are uh, Ritalin, medications for ADHD, and a placebo. And as you can see, the time on task is much higher during the treatment uh, Ritalin phase uh, versus a placebo phase. The changing criterion design is an A-B repetition, or A is, again, baseline, B is treatment. 
Uh, logic is this design after baseline treatment is given until a criterion is met and stability is achieved. Then a more stringent criterion is set with treatment applied until this new level is met and so on. It presupposes a close correspondence between the criterion and behavior change. If the criterion is not reached or behavior is unstable, then the results are ambiguous. And then the possible solutions here would be to include returning to less stringent criterion or reversing the procedure. So this is a study um, uh, by Hartman and Hall uh, reporting cigarette use in a changing criterion design. And A is baseline. And Subsequent conditions are the changing of the criterion for lowering the number of cigarettes uh, to be smoked per day. And as you can see, the subject um, pretty well followed the uh, criterion uh, all the way through the study and changed uh, in the expected direction based on the change in the, uh, the criterion. So now, to conclude, uh, we need to speak about how to analyze single subject results. Uh, the visual inspection of graph data is a long tradition in single subject design re research, and it basically involves convincing yourself and your colleagues that an intervention has had an effect. It's not always clear. Some of the examples uh, I gave earlier showed a very clear effect. Uh, some were much more ambiguous, a lot more variability in the data. So traditional statistical tests, for example, like a t-test, are difficult to apply because of autocorrelation or proximal data points being more highly cor correlated in single subject design research. And this creates a condition of serial dependency which violates assumptions that observations are independent, which are important assumptions for traditional statistical uh, tests. There are, however, ways around this problem. For example, time series analysis. Uh, I wouldn't propose to be an expert on this topic, but a very nice uh, treatment of this uh, subject of statistical analyses for single subject experimental designs is in the uh, Barlow et al. book uh, by uh, chapter by Hooley. So, concluding, single subject designs can be used with small samples, even with one person. Uh, they are flexible. Busy clinicians can do single subject design studies, and single subject design studies can help establish empirically validated treatments.